Hi folks, this is uh, post WROL training part two. I appreciate all the feedback you've given me on the first one and, and all the questions. Uh, I'll try and address what you need as, as I go along with these. Uh, there is one thing that I should have put in the first one and I didn't. Um, <clears throat> and that is firearm safety. You're going to have people of all different skill levels. Uh, all different experiences and backgrounds getting together in the same place, armed, and you need to get them all on the same sheet of music as far as firearm safety right away. Uh, second thing that I failed to mention is part of keeping that initial block of training simple is that you're dealing with a, a group of people who have just gone through a massive WROL event and they are on edge they've they've been forced to absorb a great deal uh just with the situation and you want to keep it as simple as you possibly can i apologize for leaving those two out or not expressing them enough um and uh let's move on you as the leader or trainer for your group needs to expand your knowledge base now before anything happens while you have the time and the, the means so that you have the knowledge when the, when the time comes. It's okay if you're not Mr. Tactical or Mr. Medic. Uh, starting right now, you can learn a great deal of what you need to know on your own without spending a whole lot of money. Basically putting this into a, a syllabus that you can, you can use to develop your own program. I won't go too specific on it or else each video would be three hours long. The information from the first video is still valid and it needs to be refreshed on a regular basis. As with all of this, you've got to do refresher training or it falls by the wayside. From this point forward, um, as a matter of organization for training and SOPs, I'm going to divide uh, my group into essentially tiers. Tier one is your half trained, half knowledgeable, half fit personnel. These are going to be your your assaulters, your offensive force, uh, whatever, however you want to title it. Tier two is less fit, less knowledgeable folks who can be employed defensively. Tier three folks are those who can still be tasked with something during an emergency but due to uh, being elderly or infirm uh, or just incapable of handling firearms they are not going to be in any of your your plans of this sort they still do in fact have a role though non-tiered folks are going to be your children, your uh, aged and firm people that are going to be need to be shepherded about. People can actually move from one tier to another as life events occur. Someone gets older, uh, someone grows up, someone gets injured, etc. I want you to remember now and forevermore that good drills will save your behind. Good weapons drills, response drills, counter ambush drills. You've all seen a, a movie with a soldier or marine who's blindfolded, disassembling and reassembling his, his firearm. That's a drill. That's so they're able to do it during any high stress uh, event. You've either heard in the shooting community or the sports world the term muscle memory. This comes from drills, drilling, drilling, drilling until it is ingrained. An advanced shooter during a course of fire can experience a malfunction, clear the malfunction, press on with the course of fire, and not even realize that he had a malfunction and cleared it because it is so rote to him. It is so muscle memory. This next bit applies to all tiers and even some of the non-tiered personnel who are able. We're going to cover five points today in this block. I'll do this in, in broad strokes as every situation is different. Number one, firearms safety refresher is, is constant. That's constantly going on. Number two, 
In the first video I mentioned that each individual be drilled on his own firearm. Maintenance, load, unload, malfunction drills, etc. This now needs to be expanded throughout, throughout the group so that everyone in the group uh, has good knowledge of all firearms within the group. So what you're eventually looking for is muscle memory with your firearm and each person having a good working knowledge of the rest of the firearms in the group. By this time in the emergency you've developed some sort of SOPs procedures for your group. These could include defensive procedures, react drills, lock and unlock procedures for buildings, alarm usage, etc. They need to be taught in a group setting to everyone. And going back to drills, you need to start holding drills, emergency drills, for your group as a whole. You can call them uh, intruder drills or general quarters or however you want to title them. And this is where everyone goes to their positions and can explain what they're supposed to do in those positions. You need to crawl, walk, run on this. Uh, at first, you, you're going to say that today at noon we're going to have a response drill, and that'll give everybody time to get in the right mindset and to think about what they need to do. And then when the alarm actually goes off, boom, they go to, go to their positions with instructions that they're supposed to stay there until you come around and check and perhaps quiz them about what their fields of fire are, what their duties are at that particular location, etc. Going from crawling to walking, you need to, the next step is to be able to say, okay, we're, to, we're going to have a drill tomorrow between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And then at some time during that, that time, you'll start your drill with, with alarm or whatever method you use. Do not ever, in a live environment, in a hostile environment, in a post-WROL environment, do a no-notice drill unless you have the means to verbally com communicate it to all members as you start the drill. For example, if everyone has a working radio and you have good comms, you can get on the air and say that this is a no-notice drill, go to your response positions. If you do not have that ability and you are just sounding an air raid alarm, uh, half the people are going to think it's real and you've got the uh, opportunity to have blue on blue uh, panic whatever you want to run these drills so as to give the people confidence uh, so they can build their skills you do not want it to be so much as a test but as uh, training and affirmation number four rules of engagement Rules of engagement training needs constant refresher and should be taught to everyone, everyone in your group, even the non-tiered personnel. I don't think I stressed this enough in the first vi video, and I, I want to make it clear why this is so important. First, this establishes procedure for the group so that everyone knows that deadly force is not authorized unless an outsider does X, Y, and Z. Secondly, you're now existing in a world in which formerly civilized, pampered individuals will be forced to accept a less gracious new reality in order to survive. Old sensibilities remain. Let me tell you what I mean by this. If Fred is on post and an outsider does X, Y, and Z and Fred shoots him dead and only your tier one folks have been trained on the ROE, you're all, all of a sudden going to have uh, whispering and dissension amongst the ranks of the people who weren't there and have not been trained. Uh, you don't need that kind of dissension. You need group unity and group understanding. <clears throat> Look at how many police use of force scenarios result in public outcry uh, even when they've been proved to be righteous shoots. If everyone understands X, Y, and Z, there's a societal knowledge and acceptance. You might even receive input from one of your more concerned members such as, hey, we need to put a sign outside our checkpoint that says, dear outsider, if you do X, Y, and Z, we will use deadly force on you. 
that is not unrealistic and it may be applied so if you've had that concerned person bring that up and it's something that you can tactically do you do it and then you've got the buy-in of the whole group as to what your rules of engagement are what you're doing here is you're establishing a new social compact this is very important this has to do with group dy dynamics some of you watching this might think that this is sort of an excessive uh, beating a dead horse on it but group dynamics are a tenuous thing and for a community to survive in a WROL event uh, the, the fastest tightest team is is going to be there way into the future those that couldn't get it together are not going to last item five first aid everyone should begin first aid training you need to go out now and become red cross cpr first aid cpr and first aid instructor certified it's very easy to get done you can do it in a, in a weekend take every free first aid class offered and do what you can to learn now if you have the money go and take some solid courses get your emt basic your first aid training after a WROL event should be to teach each and every member means for stabilizing a casualty. If you do not have a healthcare professional in your group that is going to take over medical duties, then your training needs to become much broader than just stabilizing a casual casualty and it needs to become progressive. This also needs to lead to CASAVAC or, or medevac procedures, uh, location of a, a, a triage and treatment area, etc. Okay, those are the five points for today. Uh, I've got to switch gears for a minute and, and go to a non-tactical, non-medical subject. And looking at the long term for a, a group or community and a WROL situation. Uh, <clears throat> Think about the skills that are in your group that you will need for the long run. Do you have a, a medical professional in the, your group? Do you have a mechanic, a carpenter, um, a blacksmith, uh, an electrician, whatever? Uh, you want to apprentice your kids to the folks in your group so they can learn these skills and pass them on. If WROL situation occurs such as so many people think it will it may be years and years till a new stability sets in in that meantime for your community to survive and prosper you're going to need these skills to carry on intergenerationally this even includes non official school skills such as the grandma in your group who was taught and remembers everything from her grandma so the way they used to do things a uh, hundred years ago you don't want these skills to be lost over time okay I'll stop flapping my gums from now um, and start working on the next segment stay safe <laughs>